Madame Tuakli, oui. vous représentez ici d'une certaine façon la voix de la société civile qui a été évoquée euh, notamment par le ministre. Est-ce que, est que vous pouvez nous dire comment de votre point de vue de terrain, euh, de contact avec euh, la vie de tous les jours, des gens de tous les jours, qui ne sont ni dans les ministères ni à la tête de grandes entreprises, comment est-ce que vous voyez cette, cet accord de libre-échange Est-ce que vous avez le sentiment que ça apporte quelque chose de plus ou qu'au contraire c'est quelque chose qui inquiète Merci beaucoup. To tell the truth, it's it's rather alarming um, for a lot of the reasons that have been stated earlier. Um, clearly, for something like this to succeed, I mean, in theory, of course, it is wonderful, and um, we hope by 2063 you will have something to sort of show for it. Um, however, I think in our current... Comment est-ce que vous pouvez parler un peu plus dans le micro parce que je crains que tout le monde ne vous entende pas. Merci beaucoup. Yeah, Merci. I have a rather soft voice. Sorry. Uh, okay, I'll start again. Sorry. I said frankly, on a personal level, I feel it's rather alarming. Um, I think that um, Uh, from the heart, I feel it's alarming. From the head, of course, it's something aspirational. And by 2063, hope that we shall be able to really witness uh, this enormous transformation of our beloved continent. However, the realities on the ground are uh, we tend uh, not to have strong domestic policies within our countries, particularly as they, re as they uh, pertain to Uh, our public policies, uh, which cover health and education, um, we're having increasing inequity, uh, inequities in our countries. We have uh, security issues, major security issues. We have weak infrastructure. I don't want to uh, repeat everything that's been said. But from the little that I understand, there would be a need to have some degree of a secure political union for there to be a successful outcome of this agreement. And um, I found it uh, not surprising that Nigeria with held back, um, given the security challenges Nigeria is going through, given its poor investment in its human capital, uh, given its poor infrastructure, notwithstanding its potential. Um, but it's not, a, it's not just about Nigeria. There, this happens even with some of the countries that have signed up to the agreement. And I think that uh, what I found most interesting was when my colleague Elizabeth was speaking about the need to establish a new order of engagement, if you will, an investment in, in, in the personnel of Africa, I think this is an opportunity for the Europeans to perhaps to start investing and assisting in the domestic investment of our youth, the same youth that we describe as the oil of the 21st century. But what are they growing up in at the moment? We, we really have to build our domestic policies to, to have a sounder, a much sounder social contract between the state and the populations. They just don't exist right now. And I think they are critical. Uh, all of the things that have been said notwithstanding, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be our failure to invest in our populations that is going to be the, the Achilles heel of this. Um, kudos to Morocco for what it's doing with its population and its women in particular. But uh, Ghana has uh, recently, we lost a huge champion in our agricultural uh, revolution, as you know, um, who was also a personal friend. Um, but beyond that, just before he died, the Ghana government very proudly announced that it was going to invest 1% of its GDP in STEM education. I mean, I was flabbergasted personally after all the lobbying we've done and the agreement that seemed to be there, that it was important for us to start looking more seriously at the type of education we're offering um, for both males and females to turn around and do that. But Ghana's no exception. And um, I think that uh, we've got to start putting our money where our mouths are. Um, I, I listened to the discussion on the European Union <laughs> 
and uh, the, the future, the possible future of the Euro, thinking about this as, as I was listening to it. And it, it, it really reinforced my fears because it, the, the trust issue, the, the unity issue, the safety and security issues, I mean, these are all the areas that we're weakest on on this continent. And so to have any reasonable semblance of... Uh, movement of trades, goods, services, and people is, is just uh, still a pipe dream. And I'm sorry if I'm coming across a little bit pessimistic, but um, we've weakened our investments in our young, not strengthened them over the past years, mostly on the continent, with various reasons, some of the reasons being valid. Uh, but we've got to reverse this if we're going to be able to really see us investing in, in this manner, in this way. Um, Again, I shan't uh, repeat some of the things that were said, but a lot of important things uh, did come up. Um, as I'll see if there was anything. I think the rule of orig uh, the rules of orig origins being made simple is is very important. Um, uh, definitely, looking at what happens already on the continent, uh, uh, where China is both our friend and potentially may cause complications down the road with something like this. Um, I, I think that's all I really would have to say. Um, and it's not about education. I mean, we have how youth are educated. We just don't have the jobs for them. We don't have the appropriate jobs for them. And again, this is, this is going to become increasingly a critical problem. Uh, it, is, it is, but it's going to become even more so unless we have a real serious attempt to invest in them, both on the domestic front and perhaps with the Europeans beginning to look at Africa differently. Thank you.